Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another joint presentation by Boltman Financial Services and Wilmick, Wisconsin Lawyers Mutual Insurance Company. We've done this for many consecutive years now, and we uh, we always enjoy uh, presenting with Boltman, the Bolton folks, Corrine, and uh, we certainly appreciate being here today. Uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, I hope you get a lot out of this. Um, we will go from uh, 10 o'clock till noon. Uh, the first hour will be about Medicare and what's involved with the Medicare system, how it works, uh, how you can avoid many of the pitfalls. Corrine Boltman will uh, walk you through all of that. Uh, that'll be the first hour. Um, if you have questions at all during the entire two hour program, um, you can send those questions via email to tom.watson at wilmic.com, tom.watson, W-A-T-S-O-N at wilmic, W-I-L-M-I-C.com. Uh, I will get those. I am Tom Watson and uh, I will uh, either respond to them or uh, uh, ask Brian or Matt or Corrine to address them, whoever's uh, most suited to do that. Um, so don't hesitate to jump in uh, with comments, questions. We mm. all learn more uh, when we hear we from you. Manage. I don't know what to do. Uh, when, we, uh, when, we, when we find out what you're thinking. So uh, first hour is Corrine. A uh, second hour, we'll take a short break, that, uh, break before 11. And then at 11 o'clock, we'll come back uh, with Brian Anderson, who is our senior claims attorney at Wilmick. And Brian is with us there. You'll see him on the screen. And then Matt Byer, claims attorney at Wilmick. Uh, and uh, I, Brian and Matt, will walk you through the anatomy of a legal malpractice insurance policy. What, what that means, what kind of protection it gives you, why is that important? Um, what happens if you make a mistake or you think you might have made a mistake? Uh, how can we help walk you through that? Um, all of those things. And again, if you have questions about it, don't hesitate to, to email us and uh, at the address I gave you. And we'll answer those and, and, uh, and fill you in as best we can. So uh, without any further ado, I, I want to thank uh, Corrine and Boltman for inviting us to participate in this every year. Uh, as I said, we, we really enjoy it. We learn a lot. And hopefully we give you some takeaways uh, as well. Uh, so with that, uh, Corrine, good morning and uh, take it away. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Thank you for the introduction. Um, if anybody has any trouble technically or has a problem seeing my presentation or anything, please um, message Tom so that we can make any changes necessary. Um, so today, as Tom said, I'm going to be talking about Medicare. Um, it's a timely subject since we're in open enrollment for Medicare right now. And um, I'm using a presentation that is a United Healthcare branded presentation. And that's partially because Medicare is a heavily regulated industry and um, all the materials that are provided to consumers have to be uh, um, approved by CMS. And so this is a CMS approved presentation for an educational meeting. So it's not a sales meeting that we're going to have today. Today is um, purely related to educational um, information about Medicare, and there's a lot to learn. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is what is Medicare, who's eligible to be on Medicare, um, what do people do if they're going to work past 65 related to enrolling in Medicare, um, what does it cover, when can you enroll, how do you pick a plan, um, you know, the, and everybody's circumstance is different. So today's information is general. Most of the time there are, uh, you know, a series of conversations related to people's specific circumstances to really determine how they should proceed. So what is Medicare? Um, Medicare is a federal health insurance program for um, citizens and people who are legal residents in the United States. And it's something that we all pay, all, everybody who's working pays into it through our FICA taxes. Um, it's a health insurance program that's primarily for people who are over 65 or um, have certain disabilities and have been on social security disability benefits for a certain period of time. There are certain conditions that allow people to enroll immediately, but for the vast majority of people on social security disability, they have to be receiving those benefits for a while before they qualify for Medicare. Um, some things about th that this slide says is Medicare is not free. Many people think that Medicare is a free program in retirement for healthcare and it's not free. Um, it's not for families. It's, it's for only people who are over 65 or qualified because of a disability. 
Um, it does kind of work in conjunction in some ways with Social Security, but it's not Social Security and it is not Medicaid. Medicaid and Medicare can work together also, but they are different programs. Um, so what is Medicaid? Uh, Medicaid is a state, gov uh, a state governmental program that's for low income people. And in Wisconsin, we have a relatively generous Medicaid program, which is unlike a lot of other states that um, have less generous benefits. And so there are circumstances where people can benefit from both their state Medicaid program and Medicare. Um, they'll co they'll um, work together to help cover people's out-of-pocket expenses for healthcare. So who can get Medicare? Um, people ha have to be, like I said, typically over age 65, and you have to have lived in the United States for at least five years in a row. Um, and there are some people, as I had said, that do qualify for Medicare because of a disability. Typically, it's either because their diagnosis is either terminal or they've been on Social Security disability benefits for at least 24 months. And um, people who also get a diagnosis of end-stage renal disease or ALS also immediately qualify to go on to Medicare. Um, as I said, some people are eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid, and the language that people use for that is called dual eligible. So duly eligible people qualify for different programs than people who only qualify for Medicare or Medicaid separately. So do people need Medicare if they work past, past age 65? That's a really common conversation that I have with my clients who are primarily attorneys and many of them self-employed. A lot of people do wanna work past 65. Um, especially now more than ever because people live a lot longer and you know they, they like and enjoy their work. So um, how do people proceed if they are eligible for Medicare? So um, the real determining factor is what is the health insurance that people have after 65? Um, when people turn 65, they become eligible for Medicare and that is typically called people's first initial enrollment period. And determining if they should delay um, enrolling in Medicare really is, um, A, it's important because if you delay and you're not eligible to delay, you can be subject to a penalty. And also um, you wanna make sure that if you um, do delay that the insurance that you have is gonna cover the cost that you, you know, any healthcare needs that you might have. Um, so the first determination is, are, is people's insurance creditable? And a relatively easy way to determine if insurance is credible is the size of the employer group. And so um, generally people who are working with employer groups that have less than 20 employees, they, their insurance tends not to be creditable. And so then those people should enroll in Medicare. Um, but if people have employer groups larger than 20 employees and also get in writing from their health insurance that their insurance is creditable, then they do not have to enroll in Medicare. And the reason to not enroll in Medicare sometimes is the Medicare Part B premium and other expenses associated with Medicare. So oftentimes what I'll do is an analysis to determine, um, you know, what are the costs for the employer sponsored insurance and what are the costs to be on Medicare and does it behoove the person to stay on their employer plan or transition to Medicare? If the insurance that someone has is not creditable, then there's no question that they should transition. But if, if somebody's insurance is creditable, then there are some additional analysis that we can do to determine, you know, should they delay or should they make the transition? And then, um, you know, this creditable conversation applies also to spouses of people The if, if someone's spouse holds the insurance, the non, the, the insurance that isn't affiliated with the employer of the spouse, um, you know, they, they are under the rules of whatever their spouse's insurance is. So um, like if a, you know, wife is working and has the insurance and the husband is over age 65, if that insurance is creditable, it applies to both participants, even at the non-employee. Um, so, I'm sorry. Um, so getting Medicare while you're still working. Um, 
some of the things that kind of come up with this analysis are, um, you know, well, people, if they're still working, um, do they want to stay, you know, have, continue having the opportunity to contribute to health savings accounts? Um, one thing that's kind of interesting is that if people are on employer sponsored health insurance, but they get enrolled in any part of Medicare, including Medicare Part A after age 65, they technically can't contribute to a health savings account any longer. Uh, so they can participate in the insurance, but not make the contributions to the health savings account. That's a consideration that people, um, you know, you have to keep in mind. Um, it's a little complicated because a lot of these rules aren't understood by even the banks that administer HSA accounts. So sometimes people get misinformation and um, I don't, I, I, I don't necessarily want to advertise this fact, but oftentimes, um, you know, these things are not really tracked or audited. So sometimes, you know, the the repercussions of inadvertently um, contributing to the HSA, you know, aren't severe, but um, it's still something that, you know, I don't like to ever do anything that is not in compliance with the rules um, in case, you know, things change over time. So being, you know, really understanding the nuances is important. Um, the other, issue is that I, I regularly work with people who are eligible for Medicare, but they are the working spouse. And so they hold the insurance. And if they transition to Medicare, their spouses or children who are not over age 65 are not eligible for Medicare and need health insurance. And so they might maintain that employer sponsored insurance relationship to make sure that their other family members continue to have insurance. Um, so the question is, you know, what does Medicare cover? Well, Medicare is health insurance for, you know, older adults, most, most often retirees. Um, that's what it was originally, you know, developed for. Medicare Part A covers hospital services and Medicare Part B in a general sense covers outpatient services. So that's kind of, you know, A hospital, B outpatient. There are some nuances to that, but um, in general, if you commit those things to permanent memory, you'll have enough information to really understand how it works. Um, with regard to the hospital services, you know, that's really the things that you would think would be covered related to hospital care. So inpatient hospitalizations, um, prescription drugs and supplies used while you're in the hospital, lab tests, x-rays done while in the hospital. Um, the, the, the issue of some blood transfusions, there is a limit to how much blood Medicare pays for. I really hadn't, that's never been an issue for any of my clients. So I'm, you know, I'm assuming, I don't know if people get billed the difference. I, I'm not 100% certain how that works, but certainly blood transfusions, you know, basically anything medically necessary in the hospital is covered under Medicare Part A. Um, also, if people have a qualifying um, medical stay in a hospital and then are discharged into a rehab facility, that is also covered under Medicare Part A. It's not custodial care, it's rehabilitative care in um, us, you know, um, like a nursing home facility. Once somebody's um, recovery plateaus though, and that care becomes custodial care, where people are just needing assistance with activities of daily living, then Medicare Part A no longer covers that care. Um, some of the things that are sort of uh, that are notable and important to understand is that so Medicare Part A is usually free um, in the history of offering Medicare plans. I've only had one client who had to pay for Medicare Part A, um, and that is because this person wasn't married and had never worked. And so um, if you haven't paid into Medicare Part A, you have to pay a premium. Um, and as I recall, it's about four hundred and fifty dollars a month. Um, it's really unusual circumstance. People who have worked at least 40 quarters will qualify for premium free Medicare Part A. Um, it's, you know, enrolling onto original Medicare is guarantee issue. So it's, you cannot be denied coverage. Um, if you're on original Medicare, it is coverage nationwide. And um, it is, this is an interesting circumstance. This must be admitted in inpatient and not an observation status. That is something that had kind of come into play more in the last couple of years, but not as much um, 
now, partially because I think people are more aware of understanding their admission status and they um, understand that if they're only in the hospital on observation status, that Medicare Part A isn't going to be covering them. So they push for um, an admitted status, inpatient status. Um, so Medicare Part B cover, covers outpatient services. That's, you know, doctor visits, rehabilitation, um, like PT, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and an outpatient clinic, um, mental health care, diabetes care, um, you know, anything that doesn't happen in the hospital and in patient status that's covered under Medicare Part B. Um, most of us receive the vast majority of our medical care as an outpatient service. So most people are utilizing Medicare Part B when they're getting medical care. Um, Medicare Part B does have a premium. It's a you know underfunded part of Medicare. So all Medicare beneficiaries do pay a Medicare Part B premium. Um, in, in 2021, the Medicare Part B premium was 148.50, and it's going to see an increase in 2022, and it's going up to um, $170 and some change. And I I haven't committed that to permanent memory yet, but um, so you know. There are certainly Medicare beneficiaries that are not on Social Security retirement yet, but um, that is seeing um, a cost of living increase more so than it's kind of ever been. And um, then also Medicare Part B premiums are going up. So um, I guess as much as our, the benefits go up, so do the costs. So um, Medicare Part B premiums though are also income-based and it's a common occurrence for my clients um, to oftentimes be subject to something called an income-related monthly adjustment. And that is when um, Social Security builds a higher premium for Medicare Part B than the standard Part B premium. And, you know, what happens with the determination for Medicare Part B is that Social Security looks back at a Medicare beneficiary's tax return from two years prior. So when they enroll, they look back two years prior after they've been on Medicare for a couple of years, they continue to do this two-year look back. So um, many times when my clients transition onto Medicare, uh, especially if they're transitioning because they're stopping working, there's an opportunity to appeal the income-related monthly adjustment. And that's a regular part of my conversation with my clients, this transition to Medicare. So not only understanding how Medicare works and the programs and insurance that you buy, to supplement Medicare, but also to manage the Medicare Part B premiums and utilize the opportunity to do those appeals. Um, and that could probably be its own um, presentation because it's very complicated. It's one of the more complicated parts of helping my clients deal with this transition to Medicare. Um, and, you know, something just for a general um, kind of income reference. Uh, Medicare beneficiaries that are filing a single tax return whose income is under or over $86,000 are subject to an IRMA income related monthly adjustment and married people filing a joint tax return with an income of, of, of about $176,000 are subject to an income related monthly adjustment. So if, if you are or clients are transitioning to Medicare in the foreseeable future, managing that income related monthly adjustment can really be a big part of the cost related to Medicare. And so, um, and you have a finite period to, to, um, to appeal the IRMA, uh, is the acronym. Um, and so that's just a definitely like in a checklist scenario of all the things that need to be done with related to the Medicare transition that definitely needs to be on the list if it applies. Um, if people are eligible for Medicare and are not maintaining creditable health insurance, and they, um, if they don't enroll in B when they're eligible, they can be subject to a, a premium penalty. It's a late enrollment penalty, um, and it stays with you for the rest of your life. So something I often say just to kind of um, uh, summarize it simply is that Social Security does not Care if people didn't understand the rules, you know, the late enrollment penalties apply whether you understand or not. There, there are no, there are very few exceptions if you are found to be subject to a late enrollment penalty. So it's really important to um, 
you know, really understand and talk to somebody who understands, you know, what these timeframes are so that they can advise you appropriately. Um, things that Medicare Part A and B, original Medicare, so again, out, uh, hospital care and outpatient services don't cover, uh, there are some out-of-pocket expenses. So there's a Medicare Part A deductible. Um, it's about $1,400. It's going to go up a little bit in 2022. Um, and you can be subject to up to four Part A deductibles a year. And so that's each, you know, a hospitalization time frame, about 90 days. So if you're hospitalized, discharged, and then hospitalized again, but after that first 90 days, you can be subject to an additional Part A deductible. Um, and then if you're hospitalized, you know, with every nine, you know, every 90 days, I mean, that's unusual, but it does happen. You can be subject to multiple Part A deductibles. Hey, Corinne, um, uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, a couple of viewers have asked uh, if, if, they're on, if they're watching the right screen. Uh, the PowerPoint slides have not advanced. I didn't know if that was the intent or not. Uh, they're still on page, uh, slide number 13. Um, Is that correct? Hmm. My page number. Can you see the right page? I'm seeing uh, on the bottom, it says page 13 on the bottom right corner. Uh, Can you see the top of the page? Does it say Medicare doesn't cover everything? No, it's a, it's it's a, it says original Medicare parts A and B. It's that first screen that you had up at the beginning of your presentation. Okay. Hang on. I'm going to open and close my presentation. Okay. Let's see. Oh, wait, let's see. Here. I'm sorry. Um, I'm just working. On no, that's okay. That's okay. So uh, it bring it over here. Yes. Close it. It says your screen sharing is paused. Can you, now? Do you see it? No, same slide. Okay. Tell. Tell him what it says because the other friend is on. Rick, um, I'm seeing a banner that says your screen sharing is paused. Hmm. Is that a viewer next to you? Just a Same, okay, yeah, same screen, Corinne. Okay, I'm going to close my presentation and open it just a second. Okay, all right. Go. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Alicia, see you. Okay. So now let me go back and open my presentation. <laughs> sorry, folks, for the technical yeah, difficulties. Sorry. Please stand by. No, no, that's okay, Karina. It's not your fault. Okay. So then now. Okay. Share screen. There we go. So, uh, do you? Do, it says get to know Medicare. I assume this. Okay, is so the, now I'm going to go to my. Let me go to the full screen mode, and then now. This. Do you see Medicare doesn't cover everything? No, it's that same first screen. Get get to know Medicare. Um, can Rick assist me? Right, but it's not advancing. Are you seeing the advancing? It still says that. And I have a banner that says your screen sharing is paused. My colleague is going to help me. She's peeking through my screen saver. Your screen sharing is back to bottom. Your screen sharing is paused. I wonder if I have to do it every resume share. Sounds like you have double screens up and we're hearing. Okay. Okay. Now do you see Medicare doesn't cover everything? Yes. There you go. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. 
technical yep, difficulties. Yep. I, 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 think we're caught up. Yeah, okay. I think we're I think we're caught up. Uh, folks, sorry about that. Uh, you okay. should be good to go here. Okay. Okay. Do people see Medicare doesn't cover everything? Yes. Can you can you try advancing one screen just to okay. see if it works? Yep. Where can I get more met coverage? Okay. Yeah, good. Okay. Sorry. All right. Yeah. Yeah, go back. There you go. Sorry wow. about that. Okay. Okay. So um go ahead. If anybody would like copies of my slides, I'd be happy to share them with you. Um, so if if after the presentation you'd like to receive a copy of the PDF, um, I certainly can provide that to you if you'd like it. Um, okay, so as I was saying, um, we were talking about Medicare, original Medicare A and B. Um, so Medicare, original Medicare doesn't cover everything. And um, it, there are out-of-pocket expenses associated with original Medicare. And that's really essentially why people are buying supplemental insurance. Um, Medicare Part A, like I said, has a deductible. And then Medicare Part B has a deductible. That's not a lot of money. It's $233 in 2022. But Medicare Part B, which is outpatient services, does have 20% coinsurance to no maximum. So unlike your health insurance, which tends to have a maximum out-of-pocket on an annual basis, um, outpatient services, Medicare Part B doesn't have that. So you want to make sure that you can um, have supplemental insurance that helps to create essentially a stop loss so that you don't have you know, a runaway train of medical expenses. Um, Original Medicare also doesn't cover prescription drugs. So all Medicare beneficiaries need to enroll in either a freestanding drug plan, or if they enroll in an Advantage plan, they want to verify that they have the drugs included with that MAPD. There are only some rare occasions where people don't need additional drug coverage, and that ten tends to be people who have benefits through the VA. Um, Medicare doesn't cover dental and vision or hearing aids, and that's been a topic of conversation a lot this year um, with regard to some of the congressional bills that have been proposed. Um, I, as I understand it, I think they've made a little progress potentially on the covering of hearing aids, but still Medicare does not cover dental and vision care, doesn't cover eyeglasses. Um, one thing I do often say is that Medicare does cover the care and treatment of your eyeballs but they don't care if you can see. So, um, you know, glaucoma, cataracts, all of that is covered by original Medicare, but the actual refraction visit, the eyeglasses or contact lenses, that's not covered by Medicare. Um, something I mentioned before about the rehabilitative care is custodial care is not covered. So um, custodial care is care that is um, helping with the activities of daily living. Uh, if it's not medical based care, for rehabilitation purposes, Medicare does not cover it. Um, there's something called Medicare access, Part B access charges. Um, doctors can accept Medicare reimbursement, but the law allows them to charge up to 15% more than the Medicare reimbursement rate. That's the excess charges and original Medicare doesn't cover that. And then um, care outside of the United States. And it says, except in certain circumstances, and that's really related specifically to border areas um, for people who live like on the um, Mexican border or Canadian border or in certain territories of the United States. So it does not cover, um, you know, it's not like a, there's no travel insurance component to original Medicare. So where can people get more, more coverage to, to uh, cover these out-of-pocket expenses that original original Medicare doesn't cover. Um, so that's something that I work with right now. I mean, I, I am deep in the weeds of open enrollment for Medicare with my clients. Um, what, what I do now during this open enrollment period is help people review their current coverage to verify that they have what they want for um, the next year. And so the conversation is always, um, you know, do they have people have two options and this is a very good visual aid to really understand all medicare beneficiaries get enrolled in original medicare and then they choose option one or option two option one for coverage is to have a freestanding drug plan with a medicare supplement policy and so the Part D plan covers drugs and the medicare supplement policy covers the medical costs that medicare doesn't cover or people can enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan. And a Medicare Advantage plan 
which is also called an MAPD or Part C plan, is the combination of A, B, and D combined um, and then managed by a private health insurance company that the Medicare beneficiary enrolls in. And you know these are relatively different paths. So what I do is really discuss with people the benefits of the two different paths to verify that they're getting what they need. And so um, Medicare Advantage plans during open enrollment, they, they, I mean, if you're watching regular television, it is constant um, advertising for Medicare Advantage plans during open enrollment. And so, um, met, like I said, Medicare Advantage is um, the combination of A, B, and D for most Medicare beneficiaries. And in, in my, my zip code, which I'm in Brookfield, Wisconsin, we have 35 different Medicare Advantage plans in this area. And so um, what, what people are doing is determining, you know, does the plan that they enroll in cover the doctors that they need to see, cover the medications that they have, that they take? Um, do they like any of the additional benefits that, that um, the plan offers? And, um, you know, it's, it's really important to review it every year. You cannot set it and forget it because things change and you want to make sure that as of January 1st of the next year, you don't, you're not surprised by your plan changes that you didn't foresee coming down the pike. Um, you know, the concern is always are, you know, is it going to cover everything? And so Medicare Advantage plans have to be as good as original Medicare or better. Um, and, you know, oftentimes the or better is defined as offering these additional benefits that original Medicare doesn't cover, usually dental and vision coverage, sometimes a, a wellness visit, um, or I'm sorry, wellness program, um, silver sneakers being one good example, and then also having the drug coverage embedded in the plan. You cannot be enrolled in a Medicare Advantage plan and a freestanding drug plan. So you have to buy, if you're eligible, for, or if you need drug coverage so you don't have VA benefits, everybody who um, isn't eligible for VA benefits needs to enroll in a freestanding drug plan or you don't have drug coverage. And um, there are very inexpensive ways to accomplish that, um, but you just wanna make sure that you do have the drug coverage. So, so um, I would say that the reason that people enroll in one plan or another really kind of has to do with cost and doctor choice. Um, in our area, primary, in my area in Wisconsin, we only primarily have PPO and HMO Medicare Advantage plans. Um, HMO plans are really very specific networks of doctors. Sometimes they have coverage, you know, nationwide, but it is a specific network of doctors. So you can't go outside of the network. PPO Advantage plans do allow you to see doctors that aren't included in the network as long as the plan agrees to the terms and conditions of your Advantage plan. So that's very important to understand because um, it doesn't mean that you can go to any doctor or hospital, you know, if, if a Medicare pro, or if a medical system says that they don't accept Medicare Advantage plans, it doesn't matter if your plan is a PPO and they um, offer out of network coverage. If your provider doesn't agree to terms and conditions of Advantage plans, you can't see them. Your plan won't cover them. Um, some fast facts, um, you know, you do have to live in the service area of the Advantage plan you want to enroll in. So if people um, move, they get a special enrollment period to change plans. You can't just keep it, you know, you don't want to be in a plan that doesn't have the providers you need to see. Um, Medicare Advantage enrollment is guarantee issue. You can't be denied. Um, there are, you know, provider networks and pharmacy networks. It's very important to understand. Um, Medicare Advantage plans set an annual out-of-pocket limit. So, um, and sometimes if it's a PPO plan, the in-network and out-of-network out-of-pocket max can be different, important to understand. And um, some of them do charge a monthly premium. Many Advantage plans are zero premium, zero monthly premium, but then you have a cost share in all the care that you receive. So, um, you know, nothing is free. You have to be very careful about the word free. Um, and another very important point to understand is regardless of what plan you choose, whether you choose option one, Medicare supplement plus a 
D plan or an advantage plan or you know any advantage plan, you do have to continue to pay the Part B premium. So that's an expense. I kind of always explain like that's sort of like an above the line cost. Like before you start analyzing the insurance, everybody's going to at least have that Part B premium. You have to be very low income not to pay the Part B premium. And that's usually defined as for a single person having less than $18,000 of income. And for married people, I think it's $25,000. And for most people, their social security benefits will put them over that limit. So very, very few people don't have to pay Medicare Part B. Um, as I was saying before, Medicare Part D prescription drug coverage, people get that either by a freestanding drug plan or something that's embedded in their Advantage plan. Um, in in uh, my zip code, like I said, there are 35 different drug plans. I mean, 35 different Medicare Advantage plans, and then there are 24 different drugs. And so, um, and the costs related to drug plans is the cheapest plan in my area is six dollars and eighty cents. And the most expensive plan is about $120. And the weird thing about Medicare drug plans is that the cost does not imply the value at all. And so it's very important to understand that you need to review your plan just because you have an expensive plan doesn't mean it includes all drugs. Uh, doesn't mean that it actually includes the drugs that you take. Um, they don't have an obligation to notify you if a drug is coming off of their formulary. Uh, so this is uh, your drug coverage is something that you do not want to set and forget. And also, if you're on an advantage plan, um, sometimes it can behoove people to, you know, maybe they like their advantage plan for the doctors, but their drugs are not priced very well. So if, you know, you always know that you're going to take your drugs regularly, you, you might decide to uh, enroll in a plan where seeing the doctor might be slightly more expensive but your drugs will be priced dramatically lower. And that can sometimes be, uh, you know, a worthwhile thing to do. Of course, there's always the unknown of, you know, what your health might bring in a protect particular year. So there are certainly circumstances where people will pick the wrong plan for them in a year, but we have to make choices based on what we know. And so most of the time that's, you know, we know what doctors people regularly see and we know what medications people regularly see and, or take. And so those are the um, determinations we use to pick plans during open enrollment. Um, as I was saying that um, most, the, uh, most of the drug plans do include the most commonly taken medication. And so, you know, statins, high blood pressure medications. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of um, a lot of people take levothyroxine for thyroid. Those medications are um, oftentimes free on all drug plans. They might be a little, there might be a little cost associated with them nominally. Um, where the analysis gets a lot more complicated is people like insulin dependent diabetics. Um, uh, Tom, you do have a question? Yeah, um, a question from a viewer, Corinne. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, the, the question is, is it true an Advantage plan can be more costly if you enroll five years past the original enrollment date? Um, I guess I don't totally understand that question, and I'm going to explain. I'm going to give you the answer based on what I believe you're asking. So um, Medicare Advantage plans, you know, sometimes will have a monthly premium if you are subject to a late enrollment penalty, that will be added to the monthly premium that you're charged by the Advantage plan carrier. So let's say you're subject to a late enrollment penalty either for Part D or B. When you enroll, say with United Healthcare, if it's a zero premium plan, you technically shouldn't have to pay any premium. But if you are subject to a late enrollment penalty, Social Security will communicate that to United Healthcare and they will bill you the late enrollment penalty. So, so if you don't enroll in an if you don't enroll in a Medicare plan and you were eligible for Medicare, um, you can hire a premium. But that's a relatively unusual circumstance. Mm. So his, I guess I took his question, the viewer's question, you know, is it true an advantage plan can be more costly if you enroll, say, five years past the original enrollment date? I guess he, based on what you're saying. Yes, you could, if you enroll five years past the original enrollment date, you could end up with a late 
Enrollment penalty. Enrollment penalty, yeah. But people can change Medicare Advantage plans every year. And so they, you know, like if you do Network Health one year and United Healthcare another year and Aetna one year, and, you know, there's no additional cost to changing from one plan to another. The cost would be if you are subject to late enrollment penalty. And it's okay. very interesting because it does happen. I have a, um, I have a, a person was referred to me. I don't want to say that they're my client yet because I don't want to have clients with this situation. None of my clients get this type of advice. But this woman is um, 85 years old and she has never had drug coverage. And so if she would enroll in Medicare Part D now, which is embedded in a Medicare Advantage plan. So if she enrolled in a Medicare Advantage plan, she would be subject to a $90 monthly late enrollment penalty. So in addition to the cost of her insurance. But the interesting thing about that is um, when I, I, I kind of always make note about the most costly medications that I see, um, because it's amazing just when you, you know, you thought you saw the most expensive drug you've ever seen at $150,000. Nope, this year, $220,000. So there is a medication that people take when they're um, diagnosed with multiple myeloma, and the drug is $2,000 a pill. Oh, and so goodness. the annual cost of that drug would be about $220,000. And so if somebody needs to take that drug, it is much less expensive to pay your $90 late enrollment penalty versus, you know, yeah. pay out of pocket for the drug. Yeah, so, inter um, yeah. Interesting scenario. Uh, well, the, the viewer who asked the question, if, if, uh, if you have follow-ups, please send them our way and we'll try to Okay. Clarify. Hopefully, hopefully, Corinne answered your question. Um, I, 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 it sounds like you, you, you've covered that. Um, but, but if there, are, if there's a follow up to the viewer, uh, this is to the viewer now. If, if there's a follow up, please, please send us your comment or question, and we'll, Corinne will follow and up. But, but sure. you explained it well. I, yeah, that was a good explanation. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So. Um, I will say that I definitely. Um, Tom, I'm, I'm going to expound on this. You don't have to stay on this. Yeah, no, that's fine. But, okay. Um, so I definitely have worked with people who make a plan change. And then because something is notated properly with Social Security, they get a notice from their Advantage plan that they're subject to a late enrollment penalty. And um, this is all communicated by mostly mail from Social Security or the plan and um it can be dealt with so oftentimes people receive these notices and they don't understand what they mean and i say to my clients if you get something in the mail and you don't understand what it means don't ignore it show me because i'll understand so um specific situation was i had a client who um was eligible for va benefits decided that they wanted to enroll in an Advantage plan because they would be able to receive care closer to their home and wouldn't have to travel so far to a VA hospital, which is worth, so you know, can be beneficial as you get older and need more care. And um, so they didn't have it notated in their, in Social Security's files that he had creditable drug coverage and VA coverage is creditable drug coverage. So all we had to do was show that from the date he was eligible for Medicare, he also was eligible for VA benefits, and then they waived the late enrollment penalty. So, um, but this client had not told me that that had happened to them. So they were paying this late enrollment penalty for quite some time. Um, and obviously we got that all refunded to them. So, um, you know, that's, these are, I mean, this is complicated stuff sometimes. So if you're, you know, if people run into, circumstances, it's helpful to have someone like me who's seen it a lot because, you know, you as a Medicare beneficiary will only be seeing the things that are communicated to you about a one-time circumstance. You don't necessarily have a, you know, framework to place it and understand why it's happening. So um, anyway, late enrollment penalties are a big deal and you don't want them. So you want to make sure that you enroll when you're eligible and that you don't go without the insurance. Um, so going back to drug coverage, though, uh, like I was saying, um, you know, the formularies of the different plans can vary and they don't all have all drugs. So we do the analysis to determine that people say, for example, insulin dependent diabetics, there are, you know, broad differences in cost for insulin. So you, people want to make sure that they're on a plan that has their drugs priced, you know, as best as they can get. 
And so yesterday I did an analysis for during, you know, this is open enrollment. And so if they stay on plan that they had last year, their costs will be about $3,000 more a year than, or for 2022, than the least expensive plan that they could change to. So those people, I want to make sure I communicate with during open enrollment so that they make the appropriate changes. Um, the last point on this slide, I think is really important. And so this talks about um, that Medicare Part D covers commercially available vaccines not covered by Medicare Part B. Um, Medicare Part B, again, outpatient services, covers pneumonia and flu shots. So you can get those vaccines in the doctor's office but some vaccines are not covered under Medicare Part B. And the most commonly sought vaccine that my clients deal with is um, Shingrix, the shingles vaccine. And so that is a vaccine that is administered through or covered under Medicare Part D and administered at a pharmacy. And so that's a, a common question because if you get that administered at a doctor's office, um, the drug plan will cover it will also be subject to a cost for the administration and your Medicare plan won't cover it. So um, it's always kind of impressive to me that providers don't give this information to people correctly, but um, I also give the provider the benefit of the doubt because they have a lot of different types of insurance to manage. So um, my advice to my clients, be an informed consumer of healthcare and you can always, you know, shoot me an email, ask the pharmacist, have a wealth of knowledge. They're very helpful most of the time. Um, so just ask questions. Don't assume it'll just be fine because you can't fix it once you've incurred the, um, or once you had care or incurred the expense. Um, so a little bit more about drug coverage. You know, for the vast majority of Medicare beneficiaries, this is the biggest analysis point. Um, and so this, slide explains that um, drugs are priced differently on different plans and really the analysis is to determine how you know the the lower the tier the cheaper the drug so um if people can be taking that are on the first three tiers of a drug plan normally the cost will be less and plans can um put drugs on their formulary kind of however they want to i mean they have to justify it to some extent but um the tier four and five drugs are the most expensive. And, and sometimes you can't avoid those expenses. I mean, if they're life-saving medications, you got to take them. But um, there are ways to get medications, you know, to, to make sure that you're set up and to have your drugs be as inexpensive as you can possibly have them be. Um, a big kind of point of conversation for me during this open enrollment period is, um, I mean, I often, I guess, let me say, I often say to my clients, the first two years you're on Medicare Part D, it will make kind of no sense to you. And then as you're utilizing it, it starts to make a lot more sense. So all drug plans have the same framework, whether you buy a freestanding Part D plan or a Medicare Advantage plan with the drug coverage embedded in it. They all ha can have a deductible. They don't all have deductibles, but they all can have a deductible. They all have an initial coverage phase, they all have a donut hole, and they all have a catastrophic phase. And you work your way through these different phases of Medicare D based on the, the price of them. So all drug plans negotiate different pricing for drugs also. So what you might pay for Embryol on one plan is gonna be different with another. That's a very expensive medication. Um, I believe that the monthly cost of Embryol, which is an injectable medication um, biologic, is about $5,000. So in that scenario, let's say the drug is $5,000, somebody works their way through the initial coverage phase with the first fill of that medication, and then they move into the donut hole. So, but the vast majority of Medicare beneficiaries never come out of the initial coverage phase. So if people are taking only generic medications, they'll not, you know, they're going to pay a copay for their drugs, but the cost of the drug is going to be calculated to help them, you know, as they move out of these different, out of the initial coverage phase into the coverage gap. And what it kind of does is it, you know, it, it, I mean, it seems very confusing and hard, you know, hard to understand and it kind of is, but it does make some sense because what it does is it 
makes Medicare beneficiaries have some skin in the game and some expense to their drugs in most cases, um, but then has a cap. So that $220,000 drug scenario that I offered before, um, the, a Medicare beneficiary will have the cost of their drug plan. You know, to, they have to pay for a Medicare drug plan and then have a cost share in the drug that they take. And in a $220,000 drug scenario, the Medicare beneficiary will pay about $13,000 for that. Drug. So Medicare is paying a lot. Um, so is the Medicare beneficiary. I don't dispute that, but it does cover quite a bit. Yes, Tom. Karina, a question from a viewer. Do all insurers include the same drugs in the same tier, or does the composition of each tier uh, change with each insurer? Yes, the composition of the tiers changes with every insurer. So um, even within, so some carriers will have different, multiple different drug plans, and the tiers will be different within the different drug plans. So, you know, that's a problem. Because obviously you um, are choosing an insurance with them known what your health circumstance will be for that year. But um, it definitely, you know, you make your best guesses. And in the most, for the vast majority of people, their drug may not be priced the best if they get prescribed a drug mid-year. But it... All drug plans also have a provision where the Medicare beneficiary has the right to ask for an exception if their drug isn't on the plan. But the problem with that is that the drug plan can determine the tier so that it like, let's say you're taking a brand name drug that's not on the formulary, they can deem it a tier five drug and then it's very expensive. So, um, I mean, all 24 freestanding drug plans have these drugs in different tiers. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, your second bullet point, dollar limits can change each year. Uh, why do they change it? Who is that the government changing them? Or how? Yeah. So um, Medicare determines these different, the, the, the initial coverage phase, the donut hole. Um, they also, well, actually it's interesting. The Affordable Care Act has a part of the law that actually is closing the donut hole part of Medicare. So a lot of Medicare beneficiaries don't understand that the Affordable Care Act is affecting their coverage too. Um, how exactly, I mean, how long I don't, the donut hole is going to take to close, if you will. Um, you know, it kind of depends. I mean, this can be a little political too. So, um, but, um, most of the time these dollar limits changing, um, it's negligible. So it's sort of like, just like how Medicare B had a slight increase, the, the, you know, the deductible that a plan has is determined, like the maximum deductible that the, a plan can have is determined by Medicare. And in 2021, it was $450. Um, in 2022, I believe it's about the same. So when I'm doing an analysis of Medicare Part D for my clients, what I'm looking at is the total cost. So I wanna look at the total cost a Medicare beneficiary is gonna pay premiums plus drugs. So a lot of times people get hung up on not having a plan that has a deductible. And I can illustrate to them that they will pay a substantially higher amount cumulatively for the gift of no deductible versus being willing to pay a deductible. So um, of, I'm trying to, so I recently did an analysis for a client who didn't want to plan with a deductible. And if they picked a plan with no deductible, it was going to cost them about $650 per year more to have a plan with no deductible. So, um, you know, sometimes you kind of can get hung up in the minutia, like what do I pay at the pharmacy for this one drug? And I encourage people to really think about it more cumulatively because, um, I mean, there are lots of drugs and every Medicare beneficiary is different, but like Eliquis is a very commonly prescribed anticoagulant. And that's about a $1,500 drug. And so um, for the year, and there's just kind of no way around it and the way that it works then if a Medicare beneficiary is taking that drug is that, you know, they oftentimes will have different pricing every month when they go pick up the medication because of these different phases. And that can be confusing. And like I said, by the third year, it starts to make sense. Um, but it's really important, I think, to, and, and you, can, you can do this research on Medicare.gov themselves 
to really look at the cumulative costs, you can also then break it down by a month. Um, I mean, you know, it, it can, I oftentimes say to people, the Medicare Part D reports make absolutely no sense when you first look at them, but after you study them for about, you know, 20 minutes, it starts to kind of make some sense. So be willing to take the time or find somebody who can give you advice to understand it. Don't just assume that because you have a $6 plan, you're getting a good deal. It has to, you know, I certainly have clients. I have very few clients who are on very expensive drug plans, but um, it does happen. And it's usually specifically related to brand name drugs that people choose to be on more expensive drug plans. Um, so with regard to Medicare Part D, um, again, you have to be um, enrolled in Medicare Part A, B, or both to be enrolled in D. Um, there are some people who will buy a drug plan and be enrolled only in A just because they're concerned about whether they're um, health insurance plan through their employer is creditable, um, that that's kind of a, that's a nuanced circumstance, but it does happen. So, um, and then again, you know, all plans can have pharmacy networks. Some plans only have CVS, they don't have Walgreens. So if you love Walgreens drive-through, you want to make sure you're not on that plan. Um, and, um, Again, you can be subject to a late enrollment penalty if you don't get enrolled in Medicare Part D in a timely, you know, at when you're eligible and don't have creditable coverage. So people think like, oh, I don't take drugs. I'm not going to enroll in Medicare Part D. There are two problems with that. First of all, you won't have pharmaceutical coverage if you get a diagnosis where you need drugs. And two, if you delay enrolling in D, the cost will continue to go up because of the penalty. So, um, when there is a $6 plan available all over the country, there's just no reason to be without Medicare Part D. And in the state of Wisconsin, some insurance agents will encourage people to enroll in our, our state pharmaceutical program called Senior Care. And I think that's a horrible um, plan because it's income-based and you have to do a spend down to have drug coverage. And so if you're looking to mitigate financial risk, that's not a good idea. Yes, Tom. Karina, a question from a viewer. If Advantage plans provide more coverage, that is dental and vision, why would someone still choose a Part B and a Part D plan? Um, so I, I guess I want to kind of just explain a little bit more how the you use the right language. Um, so people who chose a supplement are on original Medicare, which is A and B, and then uh, insurance that they buy supplements original Medicare. So that's a freestanding insurance plan that supplements Medicare A and B. And so why would they enroll in a Medicare supplement policy and a freestanding drug plan? Because you cannot compare having access to chemotherapy anywhere in the country to $1,000 of free dental care. So that is the analysis. If a Medicare supplement plan gives people the opportunity to go to any doctor or hospital anywhere in the country without a referral, and for some people that is far more important than dental and vision care. And, you know, I oftentimes say, um, you know, insurance is meant to mitigate risk, and we don't know what our health will bring us. And so if if it's important to people to have the option to go to any doctor or hospital to see what the possibilities are for saving their life, um, being on a Medicare supplement plan is the option. Um, you know, you can buy freestanding dental. And I also, you know, I, I, I do encourage people to think about other insurances they buy. We don't buy car insurance assuming that it, you know, will benefit from it every year with a car accident. We, we don't buy homeowners insurance, assuming that we'll take a, make a claim on our homeowners insurance plan every year. Um, you know, you're buying this insurance to cover really essentially, you know, I mean, catastrophic illness. And so for some people, if you want to have it cover your care anywhere, that's why you would buy a supplement plan. Um, and I actually do have clients right now who are actively receiving care and treatment at MD Anderson in Texas and Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And those 
healthcare systems do not take Medicare Advantage plans. And that's, um, you know, it's, it's a little bit nuanced on their website if you read about how they do accept some Medicare Advantage plans. But um, if they are willing to bill your Advantage plan and they don't cover it, you pay the difference. And, you know, it takes an awfully wealthy person to be able to private pay for health care these days. So, um, you know, I just really encourage people to get the insurance that's going to cover, you know, their needs based on what's important to them. And, and everybody's different and everybody's healthcare circumstance is different and everybody's financial situation is different. So um, my goal is to teach my clients what they're buying and have them choose what's best for them. I don't sell anything to anybody. And I do think that some plans are sold to people without them totally understanding what they're getting. So, um, okay. So, and I can expound more on that um, if those, they have additional insurance, I mean, additional questions. Um, so let's talk about Medicare supplement insurance. Medicare supplement insurance is also called Medigap insurance. Um, it, like I said, supplements Medicare A and B. And um, in most states, it is um, kind of labeled with by letter, but Wisconsin is one of three states that doesn't do that. So. Um, we have now for people who transition to Medicare after January 1st, 2020, most comprehensive plan you can buy in most places in the country is a plan G. Um, in Wisconsin, we would call that the basic plan with all riders. So, um, and then that type of a Medicare supplement plan, again, supplements original Medicare. And so it covers the part A deductible. It cannot cover the Part B deductible because of a, um, a law that passed or went into effect January 1st, 2020. So it cannot cover the Part B deductible. It, uh, the basic plan plus all riders covers, um, again, Part A deductible, Part B excess charges, a home health care rider, a foreign travel rider. Um, and so if somebody has a Medicare supplement policy, they the most they'll pay for their medical care anything covered by Medicare is $233, which in 2022 is the Part B deductible. And with a Medicare supplement plan, people can go to any doctor or hospital anywhere in the country that accepts Medicare without a referral. And so, um, and this slide explains that it covers the Part A coinsurance. It can pay, um, you know, Part B. Um, so it, like I said, I can't pay the Part B deductible, but it will pay the 20% coinsurance that is a part of original Medicare to no maximum. Um, it will give you additional uh, access to some hospital stay days. Um, really, people don't stay very long in the hospital, but it can happen. So it could be something that could benefit people. Um, there are, like I said, the foreign travel rider, people can get like $50,000 to $100,000 of additional benefits to cover them when they travel outside of the United States. Um, and the Part B excess charges, a lot of times doctors who accept Medicare might charge the excess charges, may not accept Medicare Advantage plans. So having that Part B excess charges rider can be helpful. Um, for most people in Wisconsin, and this is not the same everywhere in the country, and I do have clients in many other states, but I'm very familiar with Wisconsin, most 65 year olds, when they transition to Medicare, their a premium for a supplement is between 125 and $170,000. I mean, $170. So $125 to $170. And that plan will cover all of the same riders, nuanced. Sometimes the plans will offer gym memberships, sometimes they don't. Some of them have discounts for, um, hearing aids and glasses and things like that. Um, and, you know, so that is more expensive than a zero premium Medicare Advantage plan. But if you're a very unwell person or you have a lot of medical expenses, it actually could technically be less expensive than having an Advantage, plan, which has a max out of pocket typically of at least like $4,900. So, you know, there are, I mean, there's the known costs, which are premiums, but then there are the unknown costs, which are related to the, how our health changes over the course of a year. Um, 
So again, like I said, Medicare supplement plans uh, supplement original Medicare, unlike Medicare Advantage plans, which are the private health insurance company of your choosing administering Medicare on Medicare's behalf. So they're very, they're different. Um, like I said, path one has the Medicare supplement plus a drug plan. You're staying on original Medicare path two, which is a Medicare Advantage plan. You're enrolling in a private health insurance company that is administering Medicare on behalf of Medicare. And, you know, really the major differences in this analysis are cost and doctor choice. Um, so again, you, so you have to be enrolled in both Medicare A and B to get enrolled in a supplement plan. Um, people, you have to live in the service area that the supplement is, um, we offer care. So for example, a lot of people in Wisconsin are enrolled in a WPS supplement, but WPS doesn't offer insurance in every state. So if they move to a state that doesn't have that supplement, they can get a special enrollment period to change to a plan that is available in their state. Um, the insurance, a Medicare supplement plan is guarantee issue in your initial enrollment period. So when you first become eligible for Medicare or when you first enroll in Medicare because you're losing creditable coverage, usually employer-based coverage. And um, yeah, it says, uh, yeah, plans with more coverage generally has ha have higher premiums. Um, I tend to suggest that if people are going to buy a Medicare supplement plan, they buy it with all riders. And you can always take riders off as you utilize it and understand how the insurance works to medically qualify to make your plan more rich. And so um, a lot of times if people buy a plan that say doesn't cover the part A deductible, you know, that part A deductible is about $1,400 and you can have up to four of them a year. It doesn't take long to negate any savings you might've had by not having that rider. And then oftentimes if somebody's had a hospitalization, they can't add it because they don't medically qualify. So I, I suggest to people, if you choose a supplement, Get the richest plan you can afford at the time that you enroll and you can always make it less rich over time um okay so how does medic how much does medicare cost um so as we were saying before um medicare part b premium is uh will be about 170 dollars for most medicare beneficiaries in 2022 but it is income based and so very high income earners can pay as much as an additional I believe it's like $350 a month for original Medicare. Um, so some, you know, very high income earners are paying substantially more than the typical Part B premium. And then some plans have deductibles, some don't. Medicare supplement plans, oftentimes you won't be subject to deductibles because you'll buy writers to cover that. And then um, original Medicare has coinsurance of 20%, but if you enroll in an Advantage plan or a supplement, you know, that insurance, that cost is covered by the plan. Um, so, you know, really like how do you differentiate these plans and where, you know, how do you determine? I mean, it's so difficult to summarize and compare. I oftentimes say that when you're comparing a supplement to an Advantage plan, you're not comparing apples and oranges, you're comparing apples and tennis balls. They're not even the same type of insurance. So comparison can be difficult. But um, you know, one thing that is true is that oftentimes Medicare Advantage plans are less on a monthly basis because if they have a zero dollar premium, you can't, you know, zero dollars doesn't get cheaper than that. Um, but you do have a cost share in all the care that you receive to an annual maximum. Medicare supplement plans, they do have a higher monthly premium, but they oftentimes will cover more of the out-of-pocket expenses. And then the drug coverage, same framework, whether it's on a Medicare Advantage plan or a freestanding drug plan, and you want to make the analysis based on the drugs that you know you take and the pharmacies you use. And that's for both picking your Advantage plan every open enrollment or reviewing your freestanding drug plan during the open enrollment. So um, this chart is just, I think, relatively confusing, but it does kind of explain the different options. Um, the vast majority of my clients are going to end up either in the last row under those with original Medicare, which is A, B, a supplement plus a drug plan. 
for people in um, the, if you have an, a Part C Advantage plan, you're going to be in the, it's called an MAPD, Medicare Advantage Prescription Drug Plan. People who don't have other coverage need to enroll in a plan that is, um, that has a drug plan embed, embedded. And it's kind of interesting because oftentimes, it, depending if you go to Medicare.gov, a lot of the plans are kind of specifically designed, or some plans are specifically designed for people who have VA benefits. And a lot of times the words used to title those plans are things like a Patriot plan or things like that. So that kind of gives you um, sort of some insight into the fact that those plans don't in, in have drug coverage and they, um, they, um, I just realized how far over my time I am. Is that what you're coming on to say to me, Matt? <laughs> yeah, it's one time after. Yeah. yeah, sorry, Tom. Oh, boy. No, no, that's um, okay. Okay, well, wait, let me just double check to see if there's anything. Um, well, there's a lot. Boy, I, this is, I've done this presentation and I've never gone this far. But So there are some details about initial enrollment periods and things like that. Committing this information to permanent memory is not important. It's more important to understand when you need to transition to Medicare. So if you have clients or parents or you are kind of considering when to enroll, the good thing is to talk to an expert to get their advice about what you should do and when. Um, and again, people's specific health issues really guide the decision. So learning about it, understanding your costs, and then you can make an informed decision. Sorry, I went so late. That's okay. And I'll, uh, I'll just remind the viewers, um, we'll work together, Corrine, you and, and, and we at Wilmick, we'll work together to make sure everybody gets the materials uh, after the program okay. in the next day or two. And, Should we skip our break? Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, okay, sorry. I think we, no, that's okay. Thank you. It's, uh, it's great information. Um, uh, the questions were just uh, in my own head. Uh, you know, I'm, I was thinking about my, my own parents and, and, you know, how they were negotiating this stuff and it's, uh, it's not easy. So, um, yeah. Thanks for going through that. And as I said to the viewers, we'll we'll get you uh, we'll get you all the uh, the materials uh, emailed out to you. And if you have questions, um, feel free to follow up with Corrine and uh, the, the folks at Boltman. And if you, as we go through the next hour here, uh, if you have questions about what we're covering from Wilmick's standpoint, uh, Matt and Brian and I are available as well. Um, Matt uh, has uh, brought up the screen. Uh, I hope everybody can see it. Uh, this is our, uh, our written materials. Um, so Matt, thanks for doing that. Um, so we're gonna talk about anatomy of a legal malpractice insurance policy. Uh, again, my name is Tom Watson. Uh, I've been at Wilmick for almost 17 years now. Um, Brian Anderson is with us, our senior claims attorney. Brian has been at Wilmick for 18 years and uh, is that right, Brian? I think so. Yeah, 18 years. And uh, boy, the years the years keep flying, don't they? Um, and, and then uh, Matt Beyer, our claims attorney, works with Brian on claims. Uh, Matt's been with us five years. And um, so they, uh, Matt and Brian, have, I, I, I hesitate to say you've seen it all because uh, when we think that, we see something new. But um, you guys have almost seen it all, I would think. Um, so we'll walk through this stuff. Uh, and if you have questions, again, um, go ahead and email me. Um, and uh, uh, we will we will answer your questions. Um, so, uh, you know, who, who is Wilmick? Uh, let, let's just quickly cover that. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, we were formed in 1986. Back then there was an insurance crisis. For those of you uh, old enough to remember, um, lawyers really could not get malpractice insurance. And if you could, the very few carriers, uh, national commercial carriers that were offering it were charging um, an exorbitant uh, amount of premium for it. Um, they just didn't really want to touch lawyers, especially smaller firms and solos. And so uh, the state bar leadership uh, saw a need. They formed Wilmick. Um, we became an independent company. Um, and, uh, and lo and behold, here we are 35 years later. Um, and we, we certainly pride ourselves in offering uh, the kinds of services and, and products that you've come to know from us uh, over the years, particularly uh, things like this, uh, CLE programs that, that hopefully uh, educate and inform and also provide the credits that you need to. Um, so that's who Wilmick is. Um, why do you need malpractice insurance? Well, uh, you know, a lot of our, the, the lawyers we talk to ask, you know, is it too costly? But this comes a lot from younger lawyers. Is it, is it too costly for me? Um, 
you know, I'm not going to have a claim anyway that, you know, that'll happen to somebody else. That's a, a fairly common refrain. I don't do a lot of complex work. I should, I, I don't really need to worry about it. Um, and I don't personally have any assets to protect. Those are the, those are the things that we hear. Um, I, I think what we try to caution though is um, A, you want to protect not only your own assets, but your clients too. The idea with malpractice insurance is to uh, put your clients back in the, the position they should have been, uh, but for an error uh, that, that, you may have, that you may have committed. Uh, uh, malpractice insurance covers negligence and, and even the best lawyers uh, can make a mistake and we see it and Brian and Matt will talk more about that. Um, so, you know, the idea is to protect your clients too and, and that's an important aspect of it. And you get peace of mind, right? You, it's like auto insurance too. You don't want to drive around without auto insurance. And so um, you don't want to practice without malpractice insurance either. Uh, mistakes happen. There's no doubt about it. Um, we also are asked sometimes, you know, is it mandatory? Well, it's not. Um, there are there are certainly lawyers out there and law firms that, that uh, go bare, as we say. They don't have malpractice insurance coverage. Um, we don't recommend that, obviously, but, um, but it does occur. Um, there's no requirement here. Actually, um, as we show in the outline, Oregon is the only state uh, that requires malpractice insurance. The uh, provinces up in Canada also require it, um, but in the United States, uh, just the state of Oregon. It certainly gets talked about from time to time about whether it should be mandatory or whether even it should be mandatory that lawyers report to clients whether or not they have insurance. That's not a, mand a mandate either. Um, but those things do get discussed from time to time. Um, as far as cost, uh, you know, you can get a first year policy for, you know, anywhere from 250 to $600, a, a $100,000 limits policy uh, with a $1,500 deductible. Um, and so we, we believe that's pretty affordable. We try to keep it uh, affordable. Um, the reason a first year policy is cheaper or less expensive, I guess I should say, is because you know, you don't have any, you don't have any exposure out there. You haven't, you haven't um, built up any, any, uh, any work uh, that, that you've done over the years. And then the second year, it, it works in steps. The second year, it would go up a little bit more because now you have a year of exposure. Um, then third year, a little more. And, and then we top it out, at, we, we level it off, it plateaus it uh, after five years. And um, then the only increases or decreases you would see would be if you adjust your limits or adjust your deductible, depending on, of course, also on uh, your areas of practice, um, things like that. So um, that's kind of how it works. Um, I think I will, uh, un unless Brian or Matt, you want to jump in on any of that stuff, I'll, I'll let you guys pick up with uh, a glossary of terms, what they mean. You know, it, it, malpractice policies are claims made. And I'll let Matt and Brian uh, talk about what that means. It, it does have some implications as to when you need to report um, a, a potential claim and things like that. So, um, Brian, I guess I'll throw it your way. I, you, you've certainly been working with this stuff a long, long time, and, and uh, I know you have a, a good uh, a good way of describing it for people. Yeah, <clears throat> and uh, Tom mentioned the, that maybe you'll never have a, make a claim, never make a mistake, but. That doesn't mean you won't see a claim even when you don't make a mistake. Uh, people can file a claim, a client can file a claim or a grievance or a non-client against you for any reason or no reason at all. And just because they're angry, upset. Um, could, sorry, was there some feedback there? No, nope, you're okay. Uh, but the point is, uh, and one of the benefits of having coverage is that you'll have, someone has your back and that's the comment we have to help you through the process because once the claim is, or a lawsuit has been filed against you or a grievance, your option is that you have to defend your interest and the pro se client is going to get the benefit of the doubt and it might move forward down the line in litigation. And do you want, and I guess I'll, I'll throw out the old Abe Lincoln, but one who has his own lawyer, one who is his own lawyer has a fool for a client. And you have as a lawyer the stress and every day, pressures of practicing. One thing you don't have often in your uh, time and calendar is time to defend yourself, file answers, file briefs, whatever you need to do, have someone represent your interest at a deposition. So that's why it's such an important um, tool to have in your kit to protect you, to have someone 
who knows how to handle litigation and legal malpractice defense on your call. And that's what we would do if and when a claim comes in and you're insured with us is make sure you're represented to the best that we can. And maybe sometimes that means resolving it, but 60 to 70% of the claims that are reported to will make ultimately resolve with no money paid in indemnity. And that's an important thing to remember is that you may not have made a mistake. That's true, but you have to defend your interest. And that's where it's a complicated, and, and I know Matt will talk about the elements of a case, but it's often complicated to work through a legal malpractice case because ultimately you have to go back and understand what the underlying case was all about. And did you make a mistake? If you did, was it causal to any damages? We'll break it down further, but it's a little bit of a nuance. It's, it's a lot bit of a nuance area of law. And um, man, I know from my experience, and you haven't been here as long as me, but we've seen claims brought by, by attorneys that are litigation minded on the plaintiff side that really don't understand legal malpractice and what the elements of proof are. So it's not a, it's not an easy area to understand. And it's one that you would want a specialist to make sure they're representing your interests. Thus, uh, the importance of the policy, whether you made a mistake or not, to have someone work you through the claim or grievance, I think is an invaluable piece of the, uh, of the coverage. I could add just one clarification, uh, and that is that although in Wisconsin there is no requirement that a lawyer carry malpractice insurance, as we point out in the materials there, um, if you uh, have formed an LLC or a limited liability company, uh, Supreme Court Rule 20, 5.7 uh, does in fact require, it has minimum limits, and that's the minimum policy we offer, which is 100, 300, uh, that has to be uh, issued. Uh, and you have to, to show that to uh, uh, the bar so that everybody understands that you are holding yourself out there as a limited liability company. Uh, and I, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Brian, but that is something that should also be disclosed to your clients, uh, that you yes. are in fact an LLC and that you, know, you have this insurance. Yeah. And I, I, don't, I don't think it's a bad idea to disclose that you're covered. I, I mean, I know lawyers sometimes are a little bit reluctant, but hey, if you have coverage, you're, that's showing that you're a responsible attorney that cares about your clients. And maybe if they're in, the client hears that and is talking to someone else who doesn't have coverage, that may be a, a feather in your cap in terms of why they might want to consider retaining you to handle the matter. You bet. Um, Matt, cost, I guess, I guess the next, Matt, Matt's more involved with the underwriting piece. I'm strictly in the claims department, but we have some just general ideas there on, uh, well, I guess, Tom, thanks, Tom, you're, are you the one scrolling along there? Oh, but, that's um, me. That's Matt. <laughs> oh, Matt, okay. <laughs> but uh, I think, I, at least I've heard um, often when I get, and then I refer it to the underwriting people, but um uh, Lawyers sometimes are surprised that it's not as expensive as they might think, especially when starting out to have coverage. And we'd have, have some examples there. Man, I'm assuming those are fairly current in terms of the the rates that we're, we're quoting. They are, you know, and I often joke with folks that I went to law school because I thought there'd be no math. Um, but, uh, you know, there, our underwriting algorithms are, are more complicated, but they, they don't necessarily need to be, and they can be generalized this way. If you're, if you're in one of those practice areas that, you know, are a perennial uh, risky category um, from a malpractice carrier's perspective, you know, it's likely that your, your premium is going to be slightly higher. Um, and so, you know, if, for example, um, plaintiff's personal injury practice is one of those that, uh, it, you know, is in our top five, both in uh, frequency and severity. And so, you know, the premium is going to reflect that. Is it going to be, you know, one that is, is uh, you know, cost prohibitive? No, it's not going to be that kind of a factor. But those are the kinds of factors that we look at in the underwriting process. Um, the rest of it, as Tom mentioned, really depends on, you know, the history of the lawyer, him or herself. Uh, where, you know, if, if there is um, somebody who comes to us and they have been insured in the past or they haven't been insured in the past, but they have built up some kind of practice and there is either a negative history or no history, which is, you know, from a claims perspective, you don't want a, a history. Um, those are things that enter the equation as well. Um, so that, that's why the range seems, you know, so wide. Um, but, you know, again, it does depend 
on whether you you select you know the minimum limits. Um, uh, typically, you know, unless there's a good reason, um, you know, Wilmic will not issue an, an, an opening policy or, or a first policy you know, at limits higher than five hundred thousand um, dollars. But a one hundred thousand dollar policy is obviously going to be much less than a five hundred thousand dollar policy. So limits is another factor. Um, and you know the size of deductible. You know we offer um, through the entire spectrum of our policies. You know anywhere from you know fifteen hundred to fifty thousand dollars in deductible. Um, that doesn't always fit every policy. Um, and obviously we don't sell one where you have a fifty thousand dollar deductible and a hundred thousand dollar limits. That just doesn't make any sense. Um, but uh, you know limits, practice area, risk history. Um, all of those things enter the equation, but uh, again, for somebody who's just starting out, you know, the typical premium will be a, around 400 bucks. So that's um, that's about uh, you know that summarizes and, and resummarizes what Tom already said, but uh, gives a little more specificity about what factors we look at. Yeah. So Brian, what is a claims made and reported policy? So I was going to say that I mean the topic I appreciate. Maybe a Medicare followed by an anatomy of a legal malinsurance policy wasn't what you had in mind as a fun day spent. But, but really, the takeaway from today, from our standpoint, and uh, I thought the first program was very informative as well, but would be that uh, uh, I, I was thinking about this if you ever get a new appliance or a new vehicle or well, an insurance policy along the, you get it, you throw it in the, in the uh, drawer, and you never hope to look at it. But what we're trying to do today will be to make sure that you're getting the benefit out of your policy and kind of explaining some of the terms because it's a, they are a little different than than your normal occurrence policy. And Matt cited the very start is it's, it's a claims made and reported policy. So the question when the claim or grievance comes in is, do you have coverage? And I mean, potentially prior acts coverage. We'll get into that in a minute. But do you have coverage when the claim is made? And that's different than did you have coverage when you made the mistake? And it's just uh, something we're going to have to drill down to make sure that that's clear to anyone. And if there are any questions, please throw it on the chat or send it to Tom or, or by all means, follow up afterwards with any of us. We can try to help you on that. But um, our, my old colleague, Sally Anderson, who some of you always or probably knew, would always say that what you to report anything you want coverage for. And that's very important and true advice. And so you have to, uh, there are times when there may never be a claim and you made an error. It doesn't appear to be a big issue. Uh, the client's not angry or upset. Report it during the policy period that you are made aware of it or that you become aware of it. So whether it's a claim or a potential claim, You'll have coverage from there and there on after, which is very important. If and when you change careers, retire, uh, hang it up, whatever. Uh, uh, you, as long as you've reported the matter to us in writing, and, and this is how most, if, if you're not insured with us, most professional liability policies, if not all work, that you have to report something during the policy period that you're made aware of it, the first made aware of it, and have prior acts coverage, which we'll drill down to that term so that you're covered for now and ever after. And if it never never develops, great. You, you don't have to report it again. Um, if you switch career, careers or firms or policies, you're, you're covered for that matter, so long as it's been timely reported during the policy period. Hey, Brian, I, I'm sorry to pause the claims made portion. We have a question from a, a viewer from a risk mitigation. This is back to the LLC issue. From a risk mitigation standpoint, is there an advantage for a sole practitioner to operate as an LLC, assuming a sufficient malpractice coverage? Um, it sounds to me more like a kind of a business model question as opposed to an insurance coverage. If you have insurance, you know, great. Um, in terms of an advantage as an LLC, I, I don't know. I, I guess I, I'm not familiar I, enough to, to know my, about that. I, at least, and Matt, I'd be curious if you would have the same, but my understanding is that that LLC, although not, maybe not airtight, can uh, can help you in terms of an excess exposure. If there's if you're operating as Matt Buyer Law Office and you make a mistake and you're not not incorporated, and the claim becomes more than your coverage or is an, an excess, you can become personally liable 
um, in, in Matt's case, that wouldn't get you much other than maybe a can of beans or something. But uh, <laughs> uh, but 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 that's my understanding. At least the LLC would work to pro to protect your personal assets and liability from an excess exposure. Is that what your thoughts are, Matt? Well, no, it would be two cans of beans. But um, oh. the the LLC, I, you know, I think from purchasing a malpractice policy, um, if if that's the 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 question, uh, it doesn't have any any difference. So if a solo uh, lawyer uh, who is uh, not incorporated applies for insurance with Wilmot uh, and um, the exactly, you know, uh, another lawyer who is incorporated as an LLC as a single member LLC applies for insurance and they are otherwise exactly alike, they're going to get the exact same premium. Right. Uh, it's not going to make a difference in the policy sold. Yeah, that, yeah, I was thinking that too, that, that the LLC doesn't, it doesn't impact your insurance decision making or your insurance coverage. Oh, okay. But Brian, Brian Bink brings up a good point in terms of the, the, the exposure to a potentially personal assets, I think. You bet. The other, real quick is we've had, this came up recently in a case where um, we are a claim. You must, if you're running an LLC, be careful then if you're looking for that type of protection uh, to make sure the retention is with the LLC that's explained to the client that you don't have mixed messages return regarding who they retain. Was it the LLC or is it just you? Because that's going to be construed against you unless the, the, uh, me the uh, communication is consistent about what, what entity was retained to handle the, the assignment. If I could just hammer home, you know, the idea of, of the, the difference between a claims made and reported policy and an occurrence policy, it's illustrated in that last paragraph there under that heading, um, you know, where we, we talk about the firm who pays, you know, their malpractice policy premium for 10 years, and ultimately they just get sick of paying the money, they never use it, they've never had a claim. Um, and, you know, so they just decide, you know, forget it, I'm not paying the policy. Well, um, and, and then the next year, the, after the, the policy has already expired, you know, then a claim is made for work that was done, you know, three years ago when they did have coverage. Now, the occurrence policy line of thinking is, oh, I had a policy in place at the time, you know, so I'm covered. And that's not how claims made and reported policies work. If you don't have a policy in place and effective at the time that the claim is made, even though the work was done three years ago, uh, then you don't have coverage. Um, so that's, that's I, I think, the starkest difference. There are others, but that's, I think, the starkest difference between an occurrence policy and a claims made and reported policy. Right. You, you need to have the policy in place when the claim is, is brought forward. Exactly. Or you, you can, there, now that Matt touched on it, there is a way if you're leaving, Matt said not paying, but more likely what we see is change careers or jobs or retire. And there you want to make sure you're checking with your carrier. Is there a way that I can have coverage? I've done all this work for all these years. I want to get out of this rat race. There's a tail policy, extended uh, reporting endorsement that, that would then cover you. That's the exception to what we're talking about. You, you handle a real estate transaction today. You don't realize the description's all messed up. It's filed away and, it, and you retire tomorrow and then a year from now the claim comes in that's where you want to make sure if that claim comes in like matt just described a year from now and then you call Wilma and say well good thing i had coverage when i handled the, the closing and then you get the sad message that well yes you did have coverage when you handled the closing but that policy now expired so there's literally nothing we like to be helpful as we can be and we we do want to be helpful and that's why we're doing a program like this because we want to encourage you to have protection but we literally can't open a claim anymore because you don't have a policy. It doesn't matter that you had one when the accident happened or a mistake happened. Uh, so the, if you're getting ready to change careers, jobs, retire, those type of things, please make sure you touch base, consider your risk and your practice and consider uh, a tail policy so that you're covered from or after uh, when and if the claim ever develops. Yeah, and then we always get the question, Brian, right, about, uh, you know, well, how long should I get that extended reporting period? You know, how long should that extended period go? How, how long should the tail be? It should it be three years, six years, unlimited? We have all those options, and they all cost different premiums, but uh, and it's a one-time premium. But, you know, I we always talk about, well, 
it depends on what kind of peace of mind you want, what kind of work you did. You know, if, it, if you did a state, you know, if you did real estate work, that could, that could potentially, uh, yeah. Um, and, and also, um, you know, statistically, yes, most malpractice claims come in within two to three years of, of the work done. So that would suggest that you don't need the tail coverage beyond like say three years. However, as I know you guys will say, because you see it, you've gotten claims well beyond that five years later, 10 years later. I know it's not common, but it happens, right? Then yeah, absolutely. That, yeah. Go ahead, Brian. Oh yeah, the, you're right, Tom. And then the, the other way around, I was just thinking that we didn't really mention, but maybe you're merging with another lawyer you're, and you're getting a new policy. The other way you can cover your risk there is to have prior acts coverage. So that, and then hopefully there again, you have to decide at what period of time that Tom is mentioning. But if you have prior acts coverage back to 10 years back or back to when you started, you've now covered yourself there too for that type of, that type of issue. But real estate, certainly estate planning are some of the longest risks I would identify. Most of the time with like a personal injury, it's going to present itself quite a, quite early in the when the mistakes made but real estate and estate planning those documents can be looked by all accounts you thought you did a nice job you put the file away and it sits perfectly until someone exchanges property or there's a death in the family and it triggers an estate or a trust to, that now you first discover the issue so those two areas i would say for sure it would be worthwhile having unlimited if you practice in real estate or estate planning during your um, practice. Yeah, I, I think you're right, Brian. I think that the real driver there is practice area. And, you know, I guess the other consideration that, you know, ought to be looked at is, is the statute of limitations, which you hinted at. Um, the yeah. statute of limitations for a legal malpractice claim in, sounded in tort uh, is in 893.53. And it's, uh, it was changed in 2018, early 2018, to three years, uh, down from six. So yay. Um, but uh, the, the difficulty, as Brian described, is that the client or the claimant doesn't always know that he or she or it has been injured um, and uh, may not discover that damage um, until many years down the road. For example, in the real estate transaction, uh, you know, if, if there was an error made by the attorney in the transaction, you know, back in 2000, um, the the buyer or the seller or whoever it is that, uh, you know, is concerned about the property may not learn about it until they go to sell the property again 20 years later. So that's when they discover the rule. That's when the statute of limitations begins to run. And so in effect, you know, it's a 23 statute, 23 year <laughs> statute of limitations. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's, that's what we're, what we're trying to get at. And that's why an unlimited tail in real estate for a real estate practitioner makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And at the, um, there's no statute of repose in Wisconsin either, unfortunately, for the lawyers. Right. So it uh, really is an indefinite period. Tom, I saw, did someone ask about a, did you see the they question did, about it? They did. Uh, the question is, how much does a tail cost? And there's no easy answer to that. It depends, you know, the, as usual in the law, it depends. But uh, yeah. maybe yeah. you guys want to expound on that a little bit. You bet. You know, I think the so as Brian mentioned early, you know, it's it's called a tail, um, but its official title is an extended reporting endorsement, which just means that uh, it endorses whatever policy is in existence at the time that you purchase the tail. Um, and you know, again, here we go with math, um, but you know, there is a multiplier, and so you know, typically, you know, a one-year tail is going to carry the exact same premium as the existing policy. A two-year tail is not going to be exactly, you know, two times, um, but it's it's going to be some multiplier like that, you know, something less than two, something more than one uh, times the premium, up to three years, and so on. So that you know, and then ultimately we stop, you know, that sort of uh, increase, you know, and that's at six years. And so if you're going to buy a six-year tail, you might as well just buy an unlimited tail because I think the price is going to be awfully close to the same, if not the same. And, and it's based on, as you said, it's an endorsement. So it's based on the last policy you had and, so and, what you, yeah. and exactly. it's a, and it's a one-time premium. You pay it once right. on that, on that tail. 
Yeah. It, well, unless you're lucky enough to die in office, Tom, then you get it free. Right? <laughs> that's right. Correct. Yeah. That's then that's with Wilming, you know. So there are other yeah. carriers out there who may do it a little bit differently. But yes, uh, if you have an active policy and you happen to pass away with with a, a Wilmic policy in effect, uh, Wilmic offers a an unlimited tail. As a one thing, one I know this is kind of getting minutia, but it's not that because uh, I've seen the mistake whereby someone's winding down their practice and they decide to take a smaller limit and a smaller limit you know, as they were winding down because they're literally not doing a lot of work. They're hardly doing anything. But keep in mind, you're, what you're insuring with the tail is the work you've done as over the course of your practice. So if you only have a $100,000 policy during your last year of practice because you're handling a couple of traffic matters for buddies, that's probably great for that year. But in terms of what you did, if you did complicated estate matter, I don't, I'm just wanting to throw that caution out is don't let your guard down. Remember that the policy limit stays and continues going forward. So you, um, cause we did have one every time I've, every story I tell has a real, real sad <laughs> or a, a real event attached to it, but where the person did take their limit down and was very disappointed when they thought about, I wasn't really appreciating what I was insuring and the complicated estate work when the claim came in. So, um, Anyway, that's just something to keep in mind. I'm not trying to oversell anything. I just I want to make sure that if you're trying to protect your coverage, you're understanding how that works in terms of limits in a tail. You bet. And you know, we talked about prior acts coverage, so I'm gonna I'm gonna move past that one. Um, and okay. we did talk a little bit about gaps. And I think the most common you know gap that I see is when a lawyer will change firms. Um, when a lawyer changes firms, you know, the, the lawyer presumably has an existing policy with the firm that, that she is leaving. Um, that, and, and it, it's a mistake, you know, or it leaves a gap if you think that all of your work then is covered for all of your work at that firm um, once you leave that firm. Um, one of two things needs to happen to close that gap. The, the lawyer leaving, she needs to, to purchase uh, an, an extended reporting endorsement on that existing policy, or as, as Brian suggested earlier, you, with a new carrier um, at the firm that she's joining, uh, she can select all prior acts coverage. So then that will cover all of her work on a go forward basis under the existing policy at that firm. Um, and the all prior acts then will cover whatever she has responsibility for as the lawyer at the previous firm. So two ways to skin that cat, so to speak. Um, but that's that's at least the most common gap that I see. And you know there are others, um, and we'll probably hit on some of them if we haven't already. Um, but be aware of that. Anytime you make a, a change or a transition, or as Brian suggested, you have succession planning in place, make sure that you're, you're mindful of the gaps and, and you do what you can to close those with a policy in place. Yeah, and that's back to the initial comments I was making at the very beginning is report. If you are about to make a change, uh, as Matt was talking about, to avoid a gap, one way to avoid a gap is make sure you report anything. You, maybe something that yeah. you're not too worried about, but you're thinking, oh, maybe I should, yes, definitely send it in. Maybe it's an angry divorce client that was mad about their bill. They complained, That whatever. I just make sure you're, you, you're, you're protecting yourself so as to avoid a gap. You bet. Um, burning limits, Brian. You want to talk about that as far as uh, you know what the cost, so, what the effect of is as cost of a defense. The, yeah, and the example is very unlikely that's in there, but it was made to stress the point is that if you have a, a hundred thousand dollar policy and significant expenses are used to defend your interests, at the end of the say this is a defensible claim, but you may be put in a position where. Now the claimant is demanding fifty thousand to settle it, and you're down to forty thousand remaining because the sixty thousand was spent on defense costs. One thing we'll always do at Wilmick is involve you in every step of the way in the process. We will not settle a claim without your consent, and therefore, if that's if the case was worth, we would go, we'll get an evaluation early. Obviously, get your input, but if we think this is a case that has a fifty thousand dollar exposure, we're not going to run up 
60,000 defendant because we're going to have a discussion and try to resolve that type of claim. But it is it's an important to know that maybe if you're thinking, I want 100,000, maybe I want 250,000 in coverage or, or some higher amount. If I just to make sure you're aware of the fact that there is a burning limit, that defense costs do does reduce the policy limit, and um, it's just something for you to keep in mind. Yeah. All right. We talked about tail coverage exclusions. You know, um, the the typical exclusions, at least in our policy, you know, we've identified there um, intentional acts, uh, services provided for unrelated enterprises. Uh, your actions as a director or officer of a company. Um, the, the important note here, I think, is read your policy and, and figure out, you know, what, understand what you're doing um, as uh, in your professional life, uh, and then decide based on the exclusions whether or not that's the kind of activity that's covered, uh, or if there's a supplemental application that needs to be filled out uh, to obtain coverage, um, or if you just need to find coverage elsewhere. Um, but make sure you read your policy uh, to identify what the exclusions are. Um, yeah, and the pet peeve, I will say my pet peeve on exclusions are when claimants counsel and a legal male thinks they're being really nasty by alleging intentional misconduct, criminal acts by the attorney and punitive and treble damages and sanctions are being sought. That, that just is not covered. It's annoying. It's not true in most cases. So if you, anyone out there is listening that does uh, legal mail plaintiffs work just allege negligence and that there are damages <laughs> and you're going to get much better insurance coverage leave that intentional stuff for your angry email but uh, anyway that's a side note because why i say that has come up recently in a couple of new claims that i've had and the lawyers perplexed on our end that we insure because they at worst they did something that was negligent and then the, the, these ideas that you're going to string a guy up by, or a, an attorney out by claiming intentional misconduct, criminal and punitive, it just is, it's a stress that doesn't need to be there. It's not even accurate and it's not covered. So anyway, that's my, my pet peeve of claimants counsel. Un understood. So, yeah. you know, what is a claim? Well, you know, as, as Brian mentioned, if, 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 if your lawyer's sense goes off, if somebody is angry with you or they complain about what you've done or not done, uh, that's, that's enough um, uh, because it's either going to fall under the definition of a claim if they have actually made that claim against you. You know, the easiest one is the lawsuit that shows up on your desk, um, but it doesn't have to be that. It can be an email, it can be a letter, it can be uh, even a phone call. You know, it's, it, it's probably enough because if it, doesn't even, if it doesn't fit under the definition of claim in the policy, there's probably a definition as there is in Wilmix policy of a potential claim. And what a potential claim is, uh, is a set of facts and circumstances that a reasonably prudent lawyer would uh, conclude could lead or will lead to a claim against you. So it's a very broad definition. And really what it's, what it's meant to do, um, you know, is, is to encourage communication between the policyholder and the carrier. Um, you know, there is no penalty uh, for communicating uh, a potential claim to Wilmic. Uh, it's not something that's going to affect your premium. Um, you know, it's, it's, it won't affect your premium unless and until there's actually an indemnity payment made. Um, so again, you know, the whole idea is that, you know, Wilmic, you know, who has, you know, I don't, you know, Brian was here when the dinosaurs were, you know, but he's got a, a wealth of experience to draw from to be able to help. Um, and he may be able to, you know, assist in, in repairing, you know, whatever the situation is so that it doesn't evolve into a claim. Um, and, you know, so in the interest of stepping in front of those problems earlier, um, the whole idea is communicate those potential claims, those claims and those grievances to your carrier so that they can, so that Brian can try and help in those situations. Yeah. yeah and I think that one of the areas that makes, maybe would make this it's clear for everyone to understand it would be the situation where an attorney drafts a will just making it that easy now there's a dispute regarding did was dad competent when he signed it and executed the will in, in your presence and at your law firm you're as an attorney you want to be helpful and you're thinking well of course he was competent i, I met with him this is what dad wanted to do 
So all of a sudden you get a note from a disinherited beneficiary whereby, and their attorney, they want to take your deposition. You haven't done anything wrong, but the very allegation that you're being deposed upon was whether dad was competent when he executed the will and you're present. That's an issue that now you want counsel on because what can you even disclose? And this has been something I've been much more aware of, obviously working in this capacity than I was when I was out practicing, but what can you do? You want to be helpful, but you're going to lock yourself into a possible grievance or maybe a claim because you know you uh, reached the attorney line privilege with regard to what you testified to. They're trying to set you up for a claim or to make you look bad somehow. So that's where you call and you get counsel, competent counsel, not like Matt and I, I'm talking about competent outside counsel that can walk you through the process so that you don't step yourself into a claim or grievance by simply trying to be helpful. And this exact scenario comes up several times a year. And I, why I'm getting harping on it is we added uh, additional benefits coverage because that's exactly what we wanted to help attorneys avoid is uh, and help them through that process. So that there's no deductible for that. If you're being subpoenaed to provide deposition testimony, please call us. We will uh, associate you with grievance counsel and or legal malpractice defense counsel, depending on the circumstances. There's coverage up to going forward now up to $10,000 for that exact circumstance. And it's so valuable. First of all, it's very much appreciated by the attorney. And um, it may even get you out of having to sit through the deposition because maybe there's some communication that we can work through outside of your formal deposition. But the, the, that additional benefits coverage is, is a highlight of, of the repair and mitigation and, uh, and an important piece of the policy that I want to stress in this circumstance. All right, uh, fellas, in the, in the interest of time, I think I'm going to um, just breeze over a few of these things. Um, you know, a wrongful act is, is like it sounds, um, but just remember that it can be an act, error, or omission. Uh, you know, the most common, uh, you know, omission perhaps is, the, you know, the missed uh, statute of limitations um, uh, on, a, on a personal injury claim, for example. Uh, that kind of omission is certainly uh, something that would be considered a wrongful act. Uh, professional services, if what you do requires you to be a lawyer or is based upon you being a lawyer, uh, that is likely covered under your policy. It's a pretty broad definition, includes such things as lobbying um, and includes such things as uh, you know, doing some title work, you know, those kinds of things. You know, if, if you are hired uh, because you are a lawyer, uh, it, it's most likely that that's going to be included in, in professional services. Um, we did already talk about a potential claim uh, Brian, did you have an addition there? No, I, other, I, I agree. We, we, we will very broadly construe the professional services because quite honestly, the reason they're consulting with you, even though you say, is this even legal services? If, if, because you're a lawyer, they're trusting your advice and your uh, input. So we're exactly. going to be broadly construing that for coverage. You bet. Yeah. Um, we talked about additional benefits and grievances, uh, and you can see the Supreme Court rule. That's how our policy defines grievance, uh, which is an allegation of, of uh, possible attorney misconduct or medical incapacity received by the Office of Lawyer Regulation, OLR. Um, uh, keep in mind, again, when you're contemplating uh, extended reporting endorsements and, and other things like that, that uh, the statute of limitations for um, grievances used to be 10 years. It, I believe in 2020 or 2002, yeah, I think it was in 2020, it was uh, changed from 10 years to six years. Um, so that matters. Um, uh, and and if, if you're in an area that, that uh, might give rise to a lot of grievances, that may be a more important consideration, such as uh, criminal defense work, um, family law work, you know, those are those sort of involve the human emotional element uh, that, you know, clients and anybody really uh, involved in the case might uh, become upset and, and, you know, want to point the finger at, at an attorney involved. Uh, so keep and, that in mind. And the discovery rule applies there too, man. Uh, to, I, no, I think that's a, that's a straight six years from the date of the event. Is that um, like a, so that's like a repose yeah, with, with respect to grievances. Yeah, yeah, at least that's been my experience with it. Uh, we recently had a grievance dismissed because it was brought after the 10 years because it was under the old one. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, reporting duties. You know, we should talk about Supreme Court Rule 20 colon 1.4 communication. 
um, you know, the, the quote that I usually use is, you know, the problem with communication is the illusion that it occurred. Um, so, you know, it is very important uh, for lawyers. And, and the way that I sum up this rule is that, you know, as a lawyer, you have to do your job in knowing the issues, spotting issues, everything that we were all taught in law school and putting all of those things in front of the, uh, in front of the client and, and, and so that they can make a, a good decision. And that's where the, you know, the reference to 20 colon 1 point F is in sub one, sub A sub one there. Uh, one informed consent is, is, a, is a very uh, nebulous concept um, as, as it's written in that rule. Um, there's a lot of gray area, there's a lot, and there's a lot of judgment uh, calls to be made by the lawyer in communicating with the client. Um, and, you know, in, in, in doing that, you know, again, the job of the lawyer is not to make the decision for the client, but is to put the options in front of the client. Um, and that uh, involves, you know, a very thorough discussion, which uh, in, in most cases is, is better communicated in writing. Um, well, I shouldn't say better communicated, is, is, uh, is uh, buttressed by a writing. And, and we call them, I call them IAY letters, I advised you. So yeah, it's important to have the conversation about the good, the bad, the ugly with the client. Um, but I think it's, you know, from a malpractice perspective, it's equally important to follow that up with, a, hey, remember when we talked about this, this is what I advised you in that respect. And ultimately, this is what you decided. You know, that's, you know, from a malpractice perspective, the very first question that, that Brian and I usually ask a claimant when they report a claim is, where's your file? Um, and if we find that kind of a letter in there that addresses the issue of, of the claim, you know, that's great because then we don't have to, you know, you know, he said this and she said that, and, you know, no, it's right here in the letter. You know, this is what happened. You know, I asked you, you know, to communicate with me if there was any misunderstanding uh, or if there was anything inaccurate or incorrect. Um, you know, that's, that's one of the best ways I can encourage our policyholders to communicate with their clients. Most of the claims that we see, not most, but I, you know, about 20% of the claims we see, I think that number's right, um, you know, involve some element of poor communication on the lawyer's part, or at least an alleged poor communication on the lawyer's part. Uh, anything to add there, Brian, on communication? Well, I think it was worth noting that we get the call where a lawyer has missed an answer date and there's a default judgment now against the client, you made a mistake, it's a harm to the client, but you think it's, it can be reopened and vacated for various reasons. And that's what you're recommending that you, the client do. This is a unique situation where now you're in an adverse situation where your client has a potential claim against you for failing to timely, timely answer, but you're recommending a course of mitigation that I think will work, but that's where you have to walk the fine line and that made me think of it with his comment about the communication that the client has to be advised of the error, the right to other counsel, your strategy going forward, that they're not giving up any rights against you. And maybe you are the best person to handle that motion to reopen and vacate. But that's the slippery slope where the client says, well, you're my attorney. Well, now the client is potentially adverse. So uh, it may be a strategy that works and you can help them mitigate it best. But that's where the communication is just vital in terms of uh, advising the clients of their rights and avoiding some type of grievance or problem with regard to a conflict. Yeah, and sometimes uh, the, oops, sorry. Uh, oh, go, no. That, sometimes the conflict is misunderstood. So, you know, the if, if such an error is made, as Brian described, as a missed answer date or whatever it is, um, well, the lawyer wants to fix that. Uh, and so does the client. So seemingly those interests are aligned. Um, and so oftentimes what, you know, is, is uh, recommended both by ethics counsel, and you should absolutely call Tim Pierce or Aviva Kaiser for guidance in, on this. Uh, but what is recommended is that you inform of the conflict as Brian described it, which is that, you know, it may be that you have a claim against me because this error was made and it affected your rights uh, as to the, you know, whatever matter you're pursuing. Um, and that creates a conflict or at least a potential conflict. And so right now, you know, I may be the lawyer in the best position to help you fix that. And I'm willing to do that, you know, but I need your consent in writing 
to do so. And so will you please sign this and return it to me so that we have it in the file and we can proceed accordingly. Um, you know, I, I think that's, uh, you know, that is the, the nature of the conflict under 1.7. And that is what, you know, Tim Pierce or Aviva Kaiser would describe to you uh, as, as to the nature of that conflict. I know we're running, Tom, are we at the near the cutoff time here? Yeah, we're about noon. Uh, why don't we, uh, let's see what else we got just... here, man. Yeah, we, I mean, we, we're not going to get through a ton of the material, but um, hopefully that would be made available to attendees. It will um, be, and I, I've had a couple of emails about that. And so, yeah, let me remind the viewers uh, shortly after the, uh, the program, we will, uh, Katie Green from Boltman will will make sure that, that our outline gets gets out to the viewers. And of course, so if they have questions, they can certainly call us or yeah. email us at Wilmington. So we're obviously the takeaway or emphasis is report early and often on anything you okay, want to cover. All right, I will let her know that, okay? Another issue yes. that comes up real Go quickly ahead, is when, when there is a mistake and the and a client goes elsewhere or just decides to hire a new attorney, I, it's in the outline, but the client is entitled to a complete copy of their file and the lawyer should keep a copy as well. But that's one thing that's very aggravating, I know, to our insurers because they say, well, they already have everything. I copy them on all the correspondence, the emails, but that is something that can get you in trouble when, when requested. You have to, again, provide a complete copy of the file to the client so as to avoid an ethical issue. I, I don't think I'll be able to do this, but I'm going to try. Um, my parting <laughs> shot is going to be, uh, as far as the elements of legal malpractice, let me just point those out. Okay, uh, the first is, you know, there has to be a lawyer client relationship. Um, you know, that sometimes that seems simple, but oftentimes a, a lawyer's conversation with a potential client uh, can leave that potential client with the understanding, with the mistaken understanding that, uh, you know, this is their lawyer. Um, and that's not the case. So I strongly encourage non engagement letters. Um, and as we point out in the rule there under 1.3, doubt about whether an attorney client relationship exists is on the attorney to clarify. Um, so again, best way to do that is a non-engagement letter. And there are exceptions in the estate planning area, Matt, correct? Yeah. Uh, there are. Uh, there are situations when a disinherited beneficiary or the like can uh, bring a cause of action if they can demonstrate that the lawyer did not accurately uh, reflect in the documents drafted in estate planning. Uh, the uh, uh, testator's wishes. Um, a very simplified uh, version of that, but yes, there are some exceptions. Um, negligence, a, a breach of the duty owed. The duty owed is you know, that which a, a, a lawyer, in a, a reasonably prudent lawyer in a similar situation would uh, exercise in, in, in the same situation uh, toward that client. If you breach that, um, you know, then there, there is the likelihood that negligence can be established, but that's only, it's not even half of the battle. You know, let's say the mistake is obvious. It was a misstatute of limitations. That misstatute of limitations doesn't make the underlying case better. So if it's a crummy, you know, personal injury action that wasn't going to, you know, uh, yield a, a recovery for uh, the claimant, you know, it's not going to get better just because the lawyer made a glaring error. Uh, you still have to demonstrate that that error caused damages. Um, now, sometimes it is easier to establish that, um, but that is the plaintiff's burden in a legal malpractice action. Uh, and then finally, you know, the damages have to actually be collectible. Um, you know, so if uh, you know a, a disinherited beneficiary demonstrates that you know even th that the lawyer's mistake caused him some damage, but there's nothing left in the estate because you know. The, the deceased had all kinds of bills to pay and there was nothing for anybody. Well, there aren't any collectible damages. Um, so, you know, those, that's the, the very, very high view and the, you know, limited time frame to, to demonstrate what the elements are of a legal malpractice claim. But uh, again, it's in the outline um, and uh, as is the, the reference to the statute of limitations that we previously discussed. Long parting shot, you guys, but I uh, wanted to get it in there. Yeah, and, uh, well, thanks, guys. Uh, Brian, Matt, uh, thank you. Um, just a reminder to viewers, you will get this uh, written outline. And also, you know, if you have questions about malpractice insurance generally, you know, what should I get uh, if you're looking uh, to either change carriers or you haven't had it before and you, you have questions 
by all means, give us a call and, and ask us. Um, Brian and Matt, our underwriter, Joe McCarthy and, and uh, Caitlin Walsh in our underwriting department, we're all more than willing to walk you through these things and, and give you options on what's best for you. As Matt and Brian have said, um, the last thing we want to do is, is sell you something you don't need or, or, or leave you without getting something you probably could use. So um, by all means, ask questions. And if it's another carrier you have, and be sure I ask them questions too. I think Corrine's message in Medicare was the same, right? Corrine, ask questions. If you don't ask know, questions. ask don't questions. Don't assume. Never yes. assume. That's right. Um, all right. I don't see any other questions uh, from the viewers. Um, Corinne, uh, Brian, Matt, thank you. Um, and Corinne, thanks for, for having us uh, join you today. Uh, I hope your clients and, and our uh, policyholders who join got something out of this and have some takeaways. So thanks for being with us today and hopefully yeah. we can do this again. Sounds great. Thanks guys. Thank you. Have a good day everybody. Have a good day everybody.